I'll just start and pass it off to you guys. I'll just welcome everyone and pass it off okay. to you guys. Yeah, we'll just, just start seeing. We, I mean, they have the sheet. Do you want us to announce anything? Um, I can't. No, whatever. Are you saying? Yeah, I'm going to welcome them, and then you can do whatever you want. Weren't you guys sitting there at Mass? <laughs> That's your pew, isn't it? Good evening. Good evening. Is it too loud? Welcome, everyone, to our first of three-night parish mission. Thank you for coming. Um, we're going to begin today and tomorrow and Tuesday in song. So it's just an easy way to kind of corral our spirit and point us in the right direction. So I'm going to pass it off to our wonderful choir and our director to give us the cue. All right, join us as we sing Open the Eyes of My Heart. Let's stand and sing. Lord, we're gathered because we want to know you, to see you, and to believe in you. Open our hearts that we might be drawn deeper into your love. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Well, once again, everyone, thank you for uh, your presence here tonight. It tells me we got a lot of hungry people for the Lord, and that's beautiful. So we have a couple of housekeeping things before we kind of launch right into the topic tonight. Um, so first, um, it's a three-night parish mission. And if you were here on the weekend, you know, if you've never been to a mission before or even know what it is, it's just an easy, simple way for busy people to go on a mini-retreat with the Lord. So you know how the people you love and care for, good friends, whatever it is, every now and again you go out to dinner with them. You know, just something, a nice thing to do to kind of connect in a way that you don't in the regular routine of your days and weeks. Or maybe your families once a year, hopefully something like that, you go on a little vacation together just as a way to kind of bring you together and enjoy one another in a way that you don't normally get to. That's what a parish mission is spiritually with the Lord. It's just going out to dinner with them. It's going on a little mini vacation, a weekend away, so that you can kind of get to know him a little more. And he, you. So that's what this parish mission is all about, getting to know the Lord more. Now, how is it going to look structurally? It's tonight, it's Monday and Tuesday, so it's three nights, and it's 7 o'clock beginning each evening. Now, if you were here for the Masses, you know that each evening, starting at 7, it's not going to go, it's only going to be no more than two hours. Okay. <laughs> Which is true, but also no more than 50 minutes. So that's what I shoot for. Well under an hour, I promise you that. Okay. So, it's a mini thing. What are we going to be talking about? What's the theme of the three nights together for this parish mission. And the theme we're going to be opening up over the course of three nights is this. 
the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. That's the theme. Say it with me. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. What's the main thing? God? No. That's wrong. It's not the main thing. Jesus? No, it's not Jesus. Here it is. The main thing to keep the main thing, the main thing, is if you said Jesus, you're in the right neighborhood. You're just not in the right house. The house is friendship in Jesus. A friendship with the Lord in our lives. That's the main thing. Because you can know someone and not care for them. You can know someone in your mind, but you don't have a connection with them. In our gospel on Sunday, this today, last night, the gospel, remember that? It was Peter who declared to the Lord, I have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. That's the main thing. Not to know you, Lord, but to believe you. That's about the heart, like any relationship. So what we're going to be looking at over the three nights is how do we expand our heart for the Lord? How do we move closer to him in friendship? And it's not hard. We're going to talk about the four simple, easy ways to do that, to keep the main thing the main thing. So that's where we're heading. Any questions? Pregúntame. Okay, oh, here's one last uh, housekeeping. You probably got one of these envelopes as you came in. Now, we bring these envelopes because you're Catholic, and Catholics love envelopes. <laughs> am I right? Do I get an amen? <laughs> no, I know that's not true, but it's just a necessary thing. <laughs> so you can read what it's about. The last night of the mission, Tuesday night, we're going to have a collection at the very end for these. Now, it's for support, obviously. That's how we do what we do. We rely on the kindness of the people. But the reason that I'm giving them out tonight, to give you a few days to do this, is the more important piece, your prayers and intentions. Now, let me tell you really quickly what that is. At the end, I take all of the collection of envelopes home with me. I open every one, I read everything. Your prayers, if you have anything that you are lifting up to the Lord in prayer, that you would like for me and my brother priests to lift up with you in prayer, you just simply write whatever that is right up here piece of the envelope. Or if you have more than fits there, get a sheet of paper and do it, and then just put it in. This is what happens. I go back to St. Louis. I live in a house in St. Louis with 21 other Vincentian priests. It's hell. Okay, no, no, no it's awesome. But we have a chapel in our uh, first floor where we pray every day, morning prayer, mass at 8 o'clock, and then evening prayer. Your intentions, your prayers that you want us to lift up, all of those prayers go right before our altar. It's this glass prayer urn. Your prayers go in there. And then every morning at 8 o'clock at Mass, we literally lift up in prayer asking God, the same way you are for whatever it is that you're praying for, we're going to join that voice together in lifting it to the heavens. It's beautiful. It's powerful. God, we get the most beautiful letters from people thanking us. So, if you'd like for me and my brothers to do this for you, we want to. You just simply let us know what that is. Okay? Any questions about that?
All right, beautiful. Two of the 21 priests with whom I live, two of them, their whole ministry is praying all day for the intentions and the prayers of the people that we bring back. How lovely is that? You're praying for it, but then you move on with your day and do stuff. There's two of our priests that that's all they do. They just continually lift those prayers up. Gosh. So, you want us to do that, you let me know what it is. Okay. Any questions? I must be a good teacher. Okay, good. So, let's go. Let's start. I got to tell you first about this couple that I heard about that were unique married couple in that they were born on the same day, the same year. They were exactly the same age, and they happened to be married. And on their 60th birthdays, they were celebrating, as they did every birthday together, when God appeared to them and said, the two of you have been so good and faithful On your 60th birthdays, ask me anything and I will grant it to you. So God turns to the wife, 60 years old today, happy birthday. What is it you'd like? And she says, Lord, you know, we have always wanted to travel but have never had the means to do so. And God says, no problem. And poof, when the smoke cleared, she had airline tickets to countries all over the world. God turns to the husband, 60 years old today yourself, happy birthday, what is it you'd like? And he lowers his head shamefully and says, to be perfectly honest, Lord, I'd like a wife 30 years younger than me. (laughs) And God says, no problem. And poof, when the smoke cleared, He was 90 years old. (laughs) 90 years old. So be careful what you pray for. That's that's our first lesson tonight. Anyway, folks, thanks for coming. So tonight we're going to look at the question. Again, all of this is how do I keep Jesus number one in my life? The main thing. So we're going to start tonight with our topic. What is the principle with which we must live our life that will keep us turned to God? What's the principle by which we should do whatever we're doing that we can assure our turning to God? What is that principle? What is that thing? And what we're going to do this evening is I'm going to answer that question by telling you a story that Jesus taught, one of the parables in which he answers that question. And then I'm going to tell you a story answering the same question in something that happened to me. And then we're going to close it out in prayer. What is the principle? How must I live my life to receive everlasting life? Let's start with Jesus. This is the 25th chapter of Matthew. You know Jesus... Every teaching, every truth he's trying to convey, it's always, or usually, always wrapped in a story. You know, he knows people love stories, and that's how truth can be communicated much more easily than just teaching it. So a lot of his teaching was in parables and stories, like this one tonight. But what's the truth he's teaching in the story? Again, how must I live my life? And in this story, there's a master and there's some servants. And the master is our master, our God and Father. The servants are you and I. So here he's teaching something profound. Here it is. It will be like a man going on a journey who called in his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one servant, he entrusted five talents. To another servant, two. And to a third, one. Each according to their abilities. And then the master went away. 
Immediately, the servant who received the five talents, he went at once, traded and invested what he was given, and made another five for his master. Likewise, the servant who received the two talents, he went, invested and traded and made another two for his master. Well, the last servant, he buried his master's treasure. After a long absence, the master of those servants came back to settle accounts with each of them, one on one, just as our God will with each one of us at the end of our day. The servant who received the five talents came running forward, bringing the additional five that he had made. Master, he exclaimed, you entrusted me with five talents, and look what I've done. I've made another five for you. And his master smiled. I love that. His master smiled and said to him, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come now, share your master's joy. And he went running into the kingdom of joy, which is heaven, the idea. Then the servant who received the two talents came running forward, bringing the additional two that he had made. Master, he exclaimed, you entrusted me with two talents, and look what I've done. I've made another two for you. And his master smiled and said to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Come now, share your master's joy. So he went running into the kingdom of joy, tapped the keg, and they were partying. Okay, that's my addition. Okay, so then the servant who received the one talent stepped forward. I love that. The first two came running forward. The last one sheepishly steps forward. Uh, um, Master, he said, I knew you to be a hard man. And out of uh, fear, I, I, I buried what you gave me in the ground. But here it is, back in full. Even Stephen, you lost nothing. We're good. Here it is. And his master looked at him and said, You wicked, lazy servant. You did nothing with what I gave you? At least you could have invested my gifts with the bankers who could have made an investment for me. You did nothing. You there, take the talent away from this servant and give it to the servant with the ten and throw this worthless, lazy servant out into the darkness where he can wail and grind his teeth. Now, don't you just love those uplifting gospel stories? <laughs> Doesn't that make you feel good all over? I think it does. That's why I chose it to open our mission. Not because I'm some kind of sad Sally, but this is the reason. I think it's hopeful. It's encouraging, in fact. If you're doing something with what you've been given, this is some really good news. I'm going to get back to this. What's the principle by which I have to live my life in order to receive the kingdom of joy? He answered it, and I'm going to get back to it. But let me tell you another story of something that happened to me about 15 years ago in which I learned the same answer to that question, the same answer to this parable that Jesus just taught. 
and it happened in a small rural town in western Kansas. I was there to do a funeral. Any little church, never been there before at all. It took me hours and hours and hours to get there. It's a 10 o'clock funeral. I got lost out there in the middle of all that corn. And, but I finally got there about five minutes to 10. I was kind of freaking out. You know, I didn't want it to be late. It's a funeral. You want that really well. I get to the parking lot of this tiny little stone church out in the middle of the fields. I walk into the only door I see, and it's the sacristy, the room where we get dressed. Now, in this tiny church, the sacristy is behind the wall of the sanctuary, this area. So there's a big wall like here. The other side is outside here. But at this place, there's a big room back there, and that's where the priests got dressed and the servers. And then you can come out from either side of the wall to come down. So I'm getting my stuff on. And I'm thinking, it's three minutes to 10. I don't see any servers. I guess I'll just have to wing it. When the door to the sacristy swung open, smashed against the wall, and in stepped this fifth grader kid. He's Italian. Now, 15 years ago is when I, this happened and I met him. I don't think a day has gone by that I haven't thought of him and how he has turned my own spiritual life to the Lord. And that's why I want to tell you it. But I'll remember him for a number of reasons. One, because of his name. This kid's name, his first name, is the same as his last name. Isn't that weird? His name is Anthony Anthony. Now, what parent does that? <laughs> you know, that's the first question. Um, actually, is there anyone here whose first name is the same as your last name? Okay, good. <laughs> I don't want to talk smack on that. Okay, so that's the first thing that's very weird. Okay, the second thing about him, though, that I'll always remember him, he was my server for the funeral mass. And it happened that he's also the worst server I have ever had in my life. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about it and how it played out. I'm back there. It's two minutes to 10. I peek around the wall just to look. The church is packed with people for the funeral. The family's in the back. The deceased man is in the front in the casket. Up, well, of course, but in the casket up front. So I go back, the door swings open, and in steps this kid. Round face, black hair, fifth grader. He doesn't say a word. He just looks around, and then he sees me, and then he runs right towards me, this kid. I mean, running, leaping like a gazelle. You know, he gets right into my face, puts up his hand, and says, Hi, Father. My name is Anthony. Anthony. I, I said, well, hello, I'm, I'm Father Ron. Father Ron. <laughs> Is this a thing? Uh, anyway, I said, listen, I said, Anthony, Anthony, are you my server for this Mass? And I'll never forget what this kid said. Just like this, didn't skip a beat. He says, oh, no, Father. I'm not here for you. I'm here to serve God, he says. Jumps up and down. I'm here to serve God. His fists were clenched, and he couldn't wait to do it. And I was like, um, okay, whatever. You know, I said, look, <clears throat> you got one minute to get dressed. Come on, God's a busy man. Let's go. Let's get your stuff. Up. So he runs off. He gets his robe and all that, comes back and says to me, hey, Father, um, I can't really find a robe that fits me. This is a little long. And I look, and I mean, it was a little bit, not bad at all. I said, don't worry about it. I said, that'll be fine. 
I should have never said that, but I had no idea what was coming. I said, okay, we're gonna come around the wall. I'll meet you in the back. We're gonna start mass. But as we come out, get the Paschal candle. Oh, it's back there. So at this place, it was up here. Get the Paschal candle and put it in front of the deceased man, the casket. Because the Paschal candle represents resurrection! <laughs> I said, that's right. And his smile went from ear to ear. We come out. We come down. Anthony, Anthony splits off to get the candle, just as I asked him. I stopped. I said a prayer over the deceased man. And then I head back to greet the family to start. And I'm going down the church, and as I'm going, this is what I see and hear from the people gathered in the church. Ah! 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 I hear the gasping, their eyes. Ah! And I'm like, what, what's happening? I didn't, and so I stop, and I look back, and I go, ah! like that. Let me tell you, what happened was the week before I got there was Catholic Schools Week in the Salina Diocese of Kansas. And the kids at the school there at the church made a big banner with the theme that year of Catholic Schools Week. And it was hanging on the Paschal candle holder for all the masses for people to see that was now right in front of the deceased man. And do you know what the theme of Catholic Schools Week was that year? Bloom where you are planted. What is the theme? <laughs> Bloom where you are planted. And they had a picture of a daisy. Oh, oh, I thought, what kind of sick... Do Anthony, of course, is oblivious to the whole thing. He just finished his first task serving God, and he was all, he's walking back, you know. I stop him. I said, no, Anthony, Anthony, listen, put the candle back in the sacristy. I said, it was my fault. He says, okay, Father. And just as I asked him, he comes back around, and he gets the candle leaving the stand and the banner I thought, I thought, uh-oh, mass hasn't even begun yet, and we're, it gets worse. Mass starts, we come up, at the little church here, the server sits right next to the priest. So I'm there welcoming everyone, and Anthony, Anthony is right next to me, of course, where he's supposed to be, and he's got the big prayer book. That's heavy, it's big, it's got all the ribbons, and he's waiting for me to say, let us pray for the opening prayer. And then he'd step around and then hold the book as I pray. So we're all ready. I'm welcoming everyone, and I can see him. He's like, he's like fidgeting, he can't wait to do this. It's time. And so I say, let us pray not realizing just how close he was standing next to me. So when I said, let us pray, <laughs> I smacked that kid right square in the jaw. And this is what he does. Oh! 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 Okay. Now, I did not hit him that hard. <laughs> kind of wanted to, but okay, so I thought he's down for the count. Oh my God, what is happening? I just thought, just make up a prayer, Ron. Let's go. Let's get this going. And just when I was about to launch into something, he stops his moan, oh, gets the book, thumbs the ribbon, swings around, and there he is holding it, looking at me as if to say, Got you covered, Father, got you covered. You know, I can see him moving. He's like a horse trying to get out of the gate, you know. He just 
All he wanted to do was serve God, and he was horrible at it. Oh, it gets worse. Comes time for the gospel. And at this church, the server leads the priest or the deacon with the gospel book. The server leads the priest or deacon over to the ambo, which is where we proclaim the word of God. So the idea is that the server, with, he had an oil, like a glass oil candle. So he, the server comes over, and then during the gospel stands the whole time as the gospel's being proclaimed. So he had that down. He was there. He was walking over. I'm behind him. I got the gospel book. We get about halfway when I had a little something lodged in my throat. So I cough. <clears throat> well, Anthony thinks it's one of those coughs like you're doing something wrong cough. You know, one of those. Uh -uh. So he kind of looks back like, what? Like, what's he doing wrong as he continues to walk to the ambo? Now, do you remember the part I told you about his robe being a little long? This is where it comes in. You're a server, you know this. So there he is, I cough. <clears throat> he kind of looks back, continues to walk, steps onto his robe, and at the pace that he was going, doesn't stop, he just keeps going and goes face forward right onto the marble floor like Superman. He was just, he tripped, and the last thing I saw on that boy's face was this. The last thing I saw, he trips, he flies down, the glass candle smashes against the floor, the oil chugs out, hits the wick, and <laughs> there's this huge fire, black smoke is coming up. <laughs> That's the second time I heard, oh, from <laughs> behind. There's smoke, there's fire, it's spreading down the thing. Anthony thinks he's on fire, <laughs> so he just starts rolling. He just... <laughs> smoke and fire, and I get to the ambo, and I didn't know what to do. So I just, I just did what anyone would. I, pretended it didn't happen, you know, like, maybe they didn't see. So anyway, this ambo at this little church was huge, a huge stone one, so I couldn't see over, but as I was saying the gospel, I could hear Anthony move and scrape, the smoke started diminishing, he moved, and by the end of the gospel, when I finished it, he swung around behind me, almost as if he had it choreographed perfectly. He swings behind me, got a new candle, and there he is. Stan, his hair was a little disheveled, but there he was. And you know what he did? Oh, this is horrible. He looks at me, and then he winked. Oh my God. I can't tell you what I thought, but it wasn't good. It wasn't good. Oh my God, and this is all one mass. You know, it just never ends. It was just, oh, came time for the washing of the hands. You know, there I am. I look over and he's ready. He's got the gold, uh, you know, bowl and the cruet and he's there and he's waiting and it's time. I'm at the altar, I call him up. I lower my hand to say the prayer, Lord, wash away my, as Anthony pours wine all <laughs> I just look at him, and he just looks at me and he says, I ain't got no towel. <laughs> oh, my. this is one mass, and it's a funeral mass, and it was horrible. There was more that happened, and I can't tell you, but it was horrible. It was a disaster. 
mass finally ended. I got back behind that wall. I'm taking my stuff off thinking this was just horrible. Oh my gosh, I need a beer. You know, I need a beer. <laughs> but it was 11 o'clock in the morning, so it's too late for beer. But so I got, I got all my stuff off. In comes Anthony back into the sacristy after this horrible mass, this disaster. He comes up to me, and do you know what he asked me? I swear to God. How did I do? That's what he said. I swear to God. That's what he said. How did I do? And he just looked at me, hoping, wanting something good. But I couldn't give it to him. You know, really, I can't lie like that. And I said, are you kidding? <laughs> I didn't say that, but I did say, I go, you know, Anthony, Anthony, of all the years I've been a priest, I've had hundreds, hundreds of servers, but I have never had a server with as much potential as you have. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I pulled it out of somewhere, but... He probably didn't even know what the word meant, but he, he just smiled and he says, thank you, Father. Can I serve for God again? <laughs> no. <laughs> Go home. I said, oh, I hope so. As long as I'm not the priest, I hope so. Okay. <laughs> but now, okay, all of that is true, and it's worse than that. I don't have time. But... As I told you, that happened about 15, 16 years ago. And as I also told you, which is absolutely true, I'm not sure a day goes by that I don't think of him, that I don't remember what he taught me in my own spiritual life in the midst of this horrible thing. And in fact, it happens to be the same teaching, the same lesson that Jesus taught in that parable that we heard in the opening. How must I live my life? What is the principle? Anthony had it, and it's this. Your life is not about you. Your life is not about you. I kind of think, no, I do believe, that if you took all the lessons and the teaching and the life of Jesus and condensed it down into one sentence, one principle, it would be that. Your life is not about you. See, Anthony, Anthony, when I first met him, I asked him, are you here for me, are you here to serve? And he made it abundantly clear to me he wasn't here for anyone or anything except for God. I'm here to serve God, he said, and he meant it. I could feel it. You know, and all through the thing, that's what he was turned toward, and he was ignited in that passion. He was on fire for the Lord. Well, literally, he was <laughs> on fire for the Lord. Now, was Anthony a good server? Okay, no, he was a horrible server. Everything it seemed that he tried, he got wrong. He went down on the floor, I don't know how many times, in the 50 minute we had that mass. He got everything wrong. But then I'm reminded of one of the most beautiful lines of Saint Mother Teresa when she was talking to her community of sisters about following Jesus, what she said is, the only thing you have to know, sisters, is this. Following the Lord is not about success. It is about fidelity. Being a disciple of the Lord is not about success. It is about fidelity. It is about being faithful to your desire for the Lord in your life. 
That is what Jesus wants from you and me. Don't worry about how it looks. Don't worry about what happens in the midst of it. All he wants is the heart. See, and that's what Anthony had. That's what those first two servants in the parable Jesus taught also had. What happened? The master entrusted to them all of this goodness, whatever it was, this treasure, it says, like you and I have been blessed and given so much treasure. What did those first two servants do with what they were given? Well, in fact, it happens to be the same thing that this little fifth grader did with what he was given in his own treasure and desire. They invested it. Those first two servants received the treasure, and then the rest of their life was about investing, being grateful for what they were given, and bringing it back in abundance to the master who gave it to them. They received the treasure, and then their life was about recognizing the gifts that they had and then expanding them in a way that brought abundance back to the master who gave it to them. And therein lies one of the most beautiful definitions of what it means to be a disciple. Disciple is someone who lives their life for Christ. Who lives their life for Christ. In other words, how you live your life should put a smile on the master's face. That's what those first two servants did. They had success, they had failure, but in the end, when they told the master about how they lived their life, what did the master do? The first thing he did, he smiled. Well done, my good and faithful servant. They put a smile on his face. That is all a disciple is about. I know that at that mass that Anthony Anthony had, I know that the Lord was up in the heavens looking down, cracking up. You know, I know that to be true. I know the Lord is like, oh my God, come here, look at this. Mary, come over here. (laughs) Look at this, look at this kid. Oh my gosh, bringing such joy to the heavens. Why? Because he got it all wrong? No. Because look, all of this, simply for me. A fifth grader, someone who had no money, no stature, no nothing, except the one thing in his own little unique head, in his mind, he thought, I can do this. I mean, he couldn't, but he thought he could. (laughs) You know, and that shows initiative, that shows passion, that shows desire, and that is what the Lord wants from all of us. Fidelity. And see, the other thing Anthony had that I think also a disciple's life is all about, when he went down, what did he do? He got back up. That's the thing. That's one of the hardest things for us, is it not? When bad news hits, tragedy strikes us down, it's really hard to refocus and be able to stand back up. But that's what he did, this little fifth grader. See, if I would have been that server, and when the mass started, if the priest would have hit me in the face, or tapped me in the face, and I would have gone down, you know what I would have done probably? Just slithered out like a snake. I would have been so embarrassed. I would have just gone out and become a Baptist or something. I don't know. 
You know, but I would just be, oh my gosh, everyone's looking at me. Oh, this is horrible because it's all about me, right? And that's not what he had. For him, it was all about God. And he was so tuned to that, this kid, that when something knocked him down and turned him another way, he regrouped, he got reoriented, and then he stepped back up and went back on the path, only to be knocked down again. And then he did the same thing over and over again. That's what Jesus wants. You live your life with that kind of desire and principle. My life is not about me. It is about you, Lord. And direct everything towards him. That's when we receive the gift that those first two servants did. Come now, share your master's joy. See, the last servant, you wicked, lazy servant, For the longest time, I remember thinking, and that's who God is? I better better shape up my life. It's an angry God who will punish you if you don't do. But that's not the case at all. Because that's not what that master did. He didn't punish the servant. Because I've come to believe this about God. That He will give to you for the rest of your life whatever it is you loved most in this life. That's a just God. Whatever you love most and gave yourself to in this life, then for eternity, I'm going to now give that to you forever. And see, those first two servants, they lived their life for their master. It even says they invested, traded, and doubled for their master. Anthony was up there, ridicule and embarrassment, but he was there for his master. So he got back up. The last servant in the parable, what happened to him? I'm going to end here. What happened to him? He received his goodness, his treasure, just as all of us have, as those first two servants did. He received it, and then he went and lived his life, and what did he do that was different than those first two, that was different than this little boy? He lived everything about himself. He missed the principle, your life is not about you. He lived it for himself. He took all of it, and everything was turned to him, not to his master. So at the end of his life, when he came back, as we all will, to our master, what happened? The master said, okay, you really loved you, didn't you, in this life? Your choices and activity, everything was about you at the expense of others. You know what? For eternity, I'm going to give you you. And off he went into the darkness, into the isolation of just himself. That's not a punishment. That's what he wanted. What would have happened if that last servant did try? I mean, let's say that he received it and then he went and invested and tried to do all this, turned it, but ended up with nothing. Let's say he lost everything. What would the master have said to him? He would have come up to the master like those first two did, and he would have said, Master, um, I'm I'm sorry. You know, I I tried, like those first two suck-ups. I tried, but I lost it all. I, I just made some bad choices in life. I don't know. I lost it. I have nothing to give you. And the master would have probably said to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Come now. Of course he would have. 
Because going back to the line of Mother Teresa, what the Lord wants is not success. He wants fidelity. He wants desire. You tried, didn't you? Yeah, you did. Come on. So folks, we're going to end tonight. That's the lens by which we must live our life. The more we can see it as a gift given not for you, but for the one who gave it to you, the more we'll be moving closer towards the joy, towards the Lord. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to end tonight by I'm going to give you the one, I think, most beautiful habit that will keep us in tune with that principle. And that habit is gratitude. The more grateful you are in life, the more you will be turned to the giver of what you've been given in life. That just makes sense. So if I give you $5,000 right here, cold hard cash, you're probably going to receive it and it'll probably put a smile on your face and then you're going to say, oh, thank you. You're going to look at the one who gave it to you and say, thank you for this. The more we can recognize treasure, goodness in our life and see who gave it to us, the more we'll be turned and to say, thank you. And the more we're turned that way, as we know from this fifth grade boy, the more beautiful we become. So, as you leave tonight, everyone's going to receive, be sure and get one, one of these little stick it pads. Okay, it's like a little, you know, whatever you call them. You know what I'm saying. You can stick it. Post-it notes. Now, there's 25 to a pack. Now, here's your homework. You all have homework. And here it is. Everyone grabs one of these tonight and every night after tonight for 25 until it runs out. You put this by your bed and tonight when you go to bed, you simply jot down three things for which you are grateful from this past day. Not the past week or year, just the past day. What am I thankful for? Um, my family, whatever. Three things, not four, two, three. And then you go to bed. Wake up in the morning, you peel off that sheet from last night, then you go to the bathroom and you stick it on the mirror. And then you do your thing, do whatever. <laughs> whatever you need to do. Okay, then tomorrow night, you're going to bed, you grab this sheet, and then you write down three things from this past day for which you are grateful. Gifts, treasure, something brought joy to you, a smile on your face, whatever it is, three. You go to bed, wake up the next morning, you peel that off, go to the bathroom, stick it right next to the other one on the mirror, and then you go do your thing. Now, it doesn't have to be the bathroom, but I'm guessing everyone goes in the morning. So, if not, you probably need medication. Okay, so... There you are. Then, third night, you're going to bed, you grab the pad, three things from this past day, and so on and so forth for the next 25 nights, three things for which you're grateful. Now, here's the thing, though. This is the only rule, and it's an important one. The one rule is you can't double up on any one gift. So, you can't put my family tonight, and then night 15, um, I don't know, uh, oh, my family, I'll just, you can't do that because you already put it, and that's against the rules, and you'll go to hell. So, <laughs> okay. so <clears throat> they all have to be unique and different all the way down. And I'm telling you, now please do this. I, I started this because a friend of mine about a year ago, and I mean to tell you, what this does to your spirit and how it just starts to turn slowly but starts to open you up during the course of a day to beauty in a way that I never did before. But anyway, don't take my word for it, but do this and watch what happens. Three things, 
all unique. Because I'll, I'll tell you what's going to happen. Tonight and tomorrow night and the next maybe three or four, you're going to put three big things um, for my family, for my health, for, you know, my wife or whatever. Then the next night, it's going to be big stuff too for, you know, financial um, success, for my neighbor's wife. Oh, no, wait, no, no, no. For uh, good weather, for whatever, anyway. But the first few nights, it's going to be big stuff, which is awesome, which is great. But the real joy, the real work of the exercise starts to come as you move into the nights when you start, because you put the big stuff, you're going to have to start looking small. You're going to have to start, uh, my fam, no, I put the, uh, my, uh, I don't know, uh, for coffee. Well, don't laugh. I, I love coffee in the morning. Oh, man, I love it. And you know, a lot of people don't have it. I do. Thank you, God. I can see. That's kind of awesome. I've met people who are blind. I can't imagine what that must be like. But I can see. Every day I can see. Thank you, God, for sight. Um, oh, gosh, I'm over. I'm sorry. Okay, but that's the thing. Grab one of those stickers as you go. Three things. This chronicle of gratitude and watch what it does to you. And I'll end here by telling you that the more we live our life, not about us, but about the Lord. The more we see everything in our life as a gift and are turned to the giver, the more our life is blessed. The more goodness comes upon us. That's just how it happens. Because the more you're turned to him, the more he blesses in return. And I know that if for no other reason than this. About three years ago, I went back to this church in Kansas where Anthony Anthony was. Now, this is, you know, 11, 12 years after the horrible funeral. So I was just filling in for the pastor for the weekend so he could get away. I get to the church, didn't get lost this time, got plenty of time. I'm back there getting dressed, and I'm thinking, you know what I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I wonder if he's still a server, you know? <laughs> and I started, like the hairs on my arms started going up, and I was like, oh God, please, if he's, if he's still a server, please don't give him to me. Please, you know. But anyway, he didn't, I didn't even see Anthony Anthony. But what I did blew me away. I got my stuff. I was in the back of church ready to start at about five minutes hanging out. And then I'm looking at the bulletin boards in the back that has flyers. Well, there's this big old poster that was on the bulletin board, color poster. And it was of the bishop of the Salina Diocese, or I thought it was. I couldn't tell. I didn't have my glasses. So I was like, well, I got time. And so I went over just to see what it was about. And as I got closer, I saw, in fact, it was the bishop of Salina. And he was, you know, he's a kind of a taller guy. He's got the, you know, the pointed hat and the stick. You know. He's got all his stuff standing, filling the center of the poster. And right next to him, is standing Anthony Anthony. Much taller now. In fact, he was taller than the bishop himself. But he was standing there, he had a suit coat, and he had a tie, and he had that smile that I saw and went, oh, it's him. You know, what on earth? And do you know what this poster was? I swear to God. It was in this church, it was in all those churches in that whole diocese, and it said it right at the top. Server of the year. <laughs> this is what it had. I swear to God, server of the year, Salina Diocese. Amazing things can happen to us when we're turned and want to serve God. Amen? amen. Indeed, amen. Folks, thank you for coming tonight. I am so sorry I'm over. It's right at an hour. It won't happen tomorrow night. <laughs> I, I promise you that. I'm sorry. It was all that housekeeping stuff. But thanks for coming tonight. Grab the little sticky. Start your gratitude. Tomorrow night, we're going to look at prayer, most especially the prayer of Eucharist, in a way that 
I think you're really going to enjoy, to open it up in a way that you haven't thought about it before. Prayer. In fact, I'm going to open by telling you a story about an experience of prayer, a powerful one, that I had with a bald guy in a Walmart bathroom. <laughs> yeah, it, no, it's clean, but it's, it's, it's weird. But anyway, so come on back tomorrow night. Bring someone with you. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank our choir for singing. That was beautiful. Thank you. Let's stand and pray. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And let us go forth to love and serve God. Thanks be to God. As we go forth, join us as we sing Go Make a Difference. Thank you.